everyone for hanging out with us march 31st evening dodgers are four and two as they officially take the series against the st louis cardinals at dodger stadium to begin their home series opener this is kevin klein speaking and you are listening to the incline dodgers podcast presented by tick pick and fan sided and we've got some fun games to recap but before we do that we got some house cleaning Jake Reiner in the building, Chris Camello in the building as well as we talk about the Los Angeles Dodgers off to that four and two start that I mentioned, took the series against the Cardinals three games to one. And let's get right into it. The Dodgers were down for nothing throughout most of this game Sunday Easter. So happy Easter to everyone. Or if you're listening in April 1st, happy April Fool's Day. But anyways, they were down for nothing and the Dodgers fought back. Teoscar Hernandez connected for his third home run already on the season. And the big moment came in the eighth inning when Max Muncy took the lefty out of the Cardinals bullpen, John King deep for his first home run on the season. Max Muncy erupted for a pretty epic bat drop as well. And some passion that I really haven't seen out of Max Muncy in quite some time. So let's start there with the home run in this game. So let me pass it off to Jake Reiner to get his thoughts on this Dodgers game victory and maybe some other thoughts in general. Well, I think we're just seeing examples of this Dodgers lineup being as relentless as advertised. And the fact that they just never die, they are never out of a game. They can always slug their way back into a game if need be. And we saw that the last two nights, actually, um, they ended up losing an extra innings the night before, but um, they came back in that game and tied that game uh, up in the late innings as well. And in this, and in both instances, Max Muncy came through in the clutch. I mean, <laughs> that is just what he does. That's just the player that he is. And we've already seen some horrendous defensive plays from him at third base, which is to be expected, even though he worked on his defense all off season, didn't really seem to take so far, but that's what you get with him is that you get a questionable third base. He plays questionable defense, but man, is his bat valuable in the middle of this lineup. We knew that he was going to get a lot of opportunities with men on base, given the top three, the big three in this lineup, him and Will Smith are going to get a lot of RBI opportunities and he's coming through and no, I mean, He's been doing that his entire Dodgers career, just coming up in the clutch like this. And the bat drop was insane. He knew right away that it was gone. He talked about in the uh, in, a po in the post game interview um, with David Basse. I was listening to Dodger talk, and basically Muncie said that once Taylor Chris Taylor took second base, he recognized that the pitcher was going to change his approach with Max Muncie, given the fact that the double play was no longer in order. And so he adjusted his uh, approach at the plate and got a ball that he could very well hit a, a basically a hanging changeup or whatever it was right out of the middle of the plate and he crushed it and he didn't miss it and it was just an electric moment from him. Yeah. Any, anything to add to that, Chris, on Max Muncy or this game? Oh yeah, I mean uh, two nights in a row. The guy's been clutch, you know. Obviously, they came up short on Saturday night, but he still had a big RBI hit in that ninth inning. You know, unfortunately, uh, you know it was all for naught. But still, there's something about crunch time and Max Muncy. It just seems when the moment finds him, he will come through. And I and I know he was one of the guys that struggled last year. I mean, among the whole lineup that struggled uh, sp specifically in that NLDS against the Arizona Diamondbacks. Uh, but, you know, between what he's done during the regular season, what he's done in, in the playoffs historically, this guy just delivers on the big stage. And today was, I mean, this this looked like, oh, man, you know, we're going to have to leave with the split and the Cardinals and this and that. But they would not be denied. And he was a big part of that. So, you know, the, the whole offense kind of came through late in the game. They continually chipped away at it. And Max Muncy coming up cold off the bench like that. That's impressive. Re really great stuff. And I'm happy for him. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that they brought him off the bench because he didn't even start this game and he was able to come up big, always ready. I saw the chat mention it, and of course I want to shout out the chat for following along. Thank you all. There's so many of you right now, so I can't shout you out all individually. But while you're here, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe as well if you already are if you're not if you're not already to the podcast. Um, I saw Yangi mention it. How about Nabil Chrismat today? 
called up. He was pretty bad this spring training. I have to be honest. I was not thrilled initially about them adding Chris Smith to the, the roster just based off his spring training impressions. And of course they sent down Kyle hurt. Who's been nothing short of fantastic for the Dodgers. So I had some question marks there, but anyways, Chris Matt was a hero today. He threw two scoreless, even though he was only pumping 89 mile per hour fastballs. He was really full in the Cardinals lineup with that changeup. He was able to generate three strikeouts. So he got the win. And then, of course, shout out to Daniel Hudson, who closed it out in the ninth inning against the heart of the St. Louis Cardinals order. He got Paul Goldschmidt to strike out swinging. He got Nolan Arenado out. And this is a guy in Hudson who took a chance on himself, non-roster invite, two knee surgeries, two consecutive years, said, I'm going to gamble on it. I want to be a Dodger. And he got a save. Here we are, March 31st already. Not only two knee surgeries, but also... Double Tommy John, too, he's had in his career. I mean, just yeah. a remarkable, uh, just active resilience. I mean, he's just always coming back, trying to get back on the field. That's a guy that loves baseball and loves to win. And it's really nice to have a guy like Daniel Hudson in your bullpen, a guy who's been a closer before, won the uh, World Series with the Nationals, closing out that series against the Astros. That's huge because the Dodgers ended up having to use their closer, Evan Phillips, on back-to-back -back nights, which I'm sure Dave Roberts did not want to do. But I'll get into that whole philosophy of the, the game on Saturday when they lost in extra mm -hmm. innings and Joe Kelly and all of that. I have some thoughts about that. But back to Daniel Hudson, it's just so nice to have that guy who has that closing experience who can come in and shut the door and give – Evan Phillips a night off. The mailman delivering once again. Exactly. I want to say one thing too. You know, you guys mentioned uh, his knee issues. To be honest, if you were going to have, if you're a pitcher that's going to have those issues, um, it's better that it is in the lower body than it is with the arm or the shoulder. You know, uh, Jake, you mentioned he did have to a double Tommy Johns, but that was years ago. You know, he's really rebuilt himself as a very good and competent reliever. And I, I thought this was a great decision to bring him back. Non-roster invitee. A lot of people probably thought, oh, he's done. He's shot. No, that elbow should be relatively fresh from the last couple of years of not pitching. So let's give him a shot. If his lower body is right and that elbow hasn't been used, he's probably got some left in the tank. So uh, that was definitely a savvy call to bring him back. He's bet on himself. The Dodgers bet on him again. A low risk, potentially high reward signing, and we saw it today, closing out the two, three, and four hitters of the Cardinals, and had just some nasty stuff mixing his pitches well and uh, striking out uh, Goldschmidt. And I believe it was Gorman uh, before getting Arenado to ground out. So I hope this is the beginning of things to come. If he's healthy, he's effective. And right now, with Gratteron trying and down, they definitely need a healthy reliever. All right. So before we get into what went wrong, there is something else that has been going right for the Dodgers. And my goodness, the starting pitching is just so much fucking better this year so far. I know it's only been two series, but it's night and day this season than what we had last season where it felt like every other game we were giving up 10 runs on a consistent basis. The Dodgers starters own the Cardinals. They had a 164 ERA throughout the four games. They only gave up four earned runs across 22 innings thrown, 27 strikeouts. We saw Gavin Stone look pretty good. Today for the Dodgers, went five innings, gave up three runs, six strikeouts. I think he threw five different pitches, which versus last season, it seemed like he only threw two pitches for the most part. I saw him mix in a curveball, which I didn't know was in his bag. He threw a cutter, a sinker. He hit 97 miles per hour on his four-seamer. And, of course, the changeup, which just was really just demoralizing them early on. A fun fact that the Dodgers had three consecutive starts Yamamoto um, or Miller Yamamoto and Stone where they struck out the side to start the first inning, which is something that hasn't really happened. I think since the 19 early 1960s, if I remember reading the stat correctly. So anyways, Stone looked more com mm. confident out there. Yamamoto, who some people think he's just a rookie to me, Yamamoto looked like the guy that won three um, Japanese equivalent Cy Young's. He really bounced back, so we'll talk about him. And of course, Bobby Miller, who I felt like was just slept on across all Dodgers podcasts and a lot of Dodger fans, not take, talking about him taking, the, taking it to the next level. 
meanwhile, early on, if you remember my predictions, I said he'll be a Cy Young finalist. He threw six shutout innings, a career high, 11 strikeouts. Everything was working. It looked like he was throwing a boomerang with that changeup. Bobby Miller was the filthiest of all the pitchers. He looked absolutely insane out there. And that sixth inning where he was in a little bit of trouble, two on, two out. He was facing Nolan Gorman. He threw that fastball right down the, the upper middle of the strike zone to get him swinging, I believe. And he just had the most electrifying reaction after he accomplished that. His his ability to tunnel the baseball is kind of remarkable. When you take a look at some of the at-bats uh, Bobby Miller had, there were guys that were frozen on fastballs right down the middle or right on the corner. Guys just weren't ready for it. They didn't know where the ball was going. And so that's just a testament to his mechanics and what he's been working on in the offseason to where – the, the hitters have no idea what's going on. I, and, I, and I think you're right, Kevin, out of all of the Dodgers starting pitchers so far, he was the most unhittable. I mean, just they could not touch him. Um, and the way he ended that outing where he got out of that jam and he had that primal scream that kind of was like a combination of Walker Bueller and Clayton Kershaw. So cool to see. So cool to watch. Um, and then briefly on Yamamoto, he had talked about how he was dealing with some jet lag in Korea, yeah. some nerves. Um, there was also a K-pop performance yeah. at the beginning of the game that delayed like a the half hour. start of it for you know 40 minutes or whatever it was. So there were a lot of factors at play that that um, that led to him not pitching so well in Seoul, Korea. And now that he's back in the states and in front of a home crowd at Dodger Stadium where everything's a little bit more predictable in terms of the pregame stuff and all of that. He looked every bit of an ace out there um, and was able to come back after a 40 or so minute rain delay and finish that inning or finish, or get, you know, basically mm -hmm. be in line for his first career victory in the States. So just, uh, I can't say enough about the guy. He, he was amazing. Yeah. Uh, Yamamoto definitely, you know, uh, a lot more effective and i think my tweet that put it out there now that's more like it after striking out the side in the first inning i think that just said it all right there so really good stuff from yamamoto uh you know his five inning game you know i agree with you jake you know it, it did kind of show his grittiness as well it's like no i'm not ready to come out yet i'm gonna i'm gonna try to give, give it a go he only threw 68 pitches had this game gone you know, they took three out of four, which is impressive from a St. Louis team that'll probably be a playoff bubble caliber team this year. Uh, maybe a second wild card team. We'll see. Uh, you know, that division is really going to be up in the air. But what I'll say is that him just going the five innings really changed how that bullpen went and how that therefore how that whole game went. You know, uh, so had he gone, maybe if there is no rain delay, maybe he goes into the sixth, maybe even the seventh. Who knows? Uh, and that changes how Dave go, goes about managing the rest of that game. But overall, it was very impressive. And you saw what could be. I think this whole series, guys, you saw what could be when they are locked in, when they have a solid bullpen, when they have good start, uh, good uh, starting rotation. Uh, I mean, a really good starting rotation and everyone starts to deliver. And of course, when the offense is clicking, you saw what the potential of this team could be. Even though yeah. at times it was a little choppy, so I just wanted to. Point yeah, out. I mean they they made the Cardinals lineup look like amateurs, and I think they're a, a lot better than how we made them look. Because Goldschmidt's yes. going to the Hall of Fame, Arenado's a Hall of Famer, Wilson Contreras is an All Star catcher, Nolan Gorman looks like he's got a lot of promise. So the fact that we got to really see Yamamoto bounce back, like all the factors Jake mentioned, you just have to throw that out the window. What went down in Korea. Because that's just not fair to be in a new league, um, a new a new team, all that, and then you have to go out to Korea all of a sudden, yeah. and you're really thrown off your routine. So I think that made sense to give him that extra time off um, versus that start to this start, and it really paid dividends. The rain may have screwed some things up in terms of that length that Chris mentioned, but he had great command of the curveball. The splitter was on point and the fastball, he was able to locate it. So I do think that's the Yamamoto that we paid and what we're going to see moving forward. Um, and of course, Glass now looks good in his um, second start as well with the Dodgers. But 
they did lose that game. So I think I'm going to let Jake get some words in on his thoughts on Joe Kelly imploding, allowing five runs. Mariachi Joe. Look, we signed Joe Kelly to be in this bullpen. So he's going to be in this bullpen. And as we've come to know about Joe Kelly, he is very unpredictable. He's, he don't know if he's going to be available. He's injury prone. So there's that. And then there's the, case of him just not having command which just randomly happens and then you'll have a situation where he'll you know get into a bases loaded jam that he creates and then get himself out of it so or he'll have a clean inning i mean you never really know from night to night what you're going to get from joe kelly so i have no problem with using joe kelly in that situation because you're going to need to use him in high leverage given you know what this bullpen looks like at the moment you know you don't have trine and you don't have gratterall and i'm sure we'll get about we'll we'll, we'll talk about this just the lack of left-handed relievers in our bullpen that we can turn to in situations like these so all of those things are factors but the thing that bothered me the most about the joe kelly outing was the fact that the dodgers had a two-run lead going into that inning and when Joe Kelly was taken out of the ball game, they were down five to two. And I just feel that as a, a manager sitting in the dugout, you got to know when it's time to maybe get your pitcher out of there. Dave Roberts has been around long enough to know when his pitchers have it and when they don't. And I know there's an argument to be made there where it's like, this is a long home stand. There are no days off. So, you know, let's, you know, give the bullpen as much of a rest as we can from night to night, not overuse guys and all of that. And, and, and sort of maybe, maybe punt a game or two. I hate that. I I've always hated that. I feel like if you have the lead or you're tied or you're not that far away, you're the deficit is not too big. You should always be trying to win that game. Of course, if you're getting blown out or you're blowing another team out, that's a whole different situation. But they had a two-run lead in that inning. And just you could see from the start, the hit batters. I mean, of course, the catcher's interference is not Joe Kelly's fault. But the balk. I mean, just all of those things that happened in that inning, you just got to look at and be like, we got to get this guy out of there. And even if you bring in Vessia and he blows it, it's like at least you did something to try to mitigate the disaster. But the way it just happened, it was just like, okay, we're fine. We're fine just letting Joe Kelly just absolutely get his ass kicked out there, let him die, and not take him out of the game. I get it's early on in the season, yeah. but I just feel like the, when you have a chance to win a game and it gets into those hairy spots like that, you've got to do something in that situation. And I just didn't agree with not doing something there. So if it wasn't game five of the season, I would agree with your stance a lot stronger. But I'm going to throw Michael Grove under the bus because half of that is his fault because the Dodgers, Dodgers were up six to nothing the night before. They wanted Michael Grove to, I imagine, at least give them multiple innings out of the bullpen. You, the next thing you know, Michael Grove absolutely freaking blows it like he does in Michael Grove fast fashion, and it becomes a high leverage game once again. They had to bring in Ryan Brazier out of the bullpen. Then they had to bring in Evan Phillips out of the bullpen to close it down. If Michael Grove had just done his job, then the arms would be fresh because I can pretty much tell you for a fact, they probably didn't want to use Ryan Brazier on back-to-back -back nights. They were going to stay away from Evan Phillips until at least a save situation. So they were going to bring him out there. So that I feel like their options were kind of a little slim. Alex Vesia is really their only lefty effective out of the bullpen. And we saw what he did in this most recent game. He basically was on the verge of making that an un unattainable game as well. He allowed like two walks. He hit a batter. So I don't think Alex Vesey is the, the reason or he's the answer either out of the bullpen. So I don't really know what Dave Roberts was supposed to do well, in that situation. They're giving uh, Joe Kelly $8 million to get three outs and he didn't do his job. No, yeah. he didn't do his job. I understand that he needs to be better. I'm not I'm not giving Joe Kelly a pass here because that was, it was an atrocious performance. And I think he would even admit that to himself, but they did bring in Vesia. In that instance, he was able to get that out, and they did get out of the inning. And then they brought in Kyle Hurt, who, as we know, has been stretched out to go multiple innings, which he did. Yes. And I understand if you don't want to use guys over and over again, but clearly Evan Phillips was not untouchable that night because they brought him in that game to, to, to pitch. But, yes. so but that's the problem with making him your dedicated closer. No, and I understand. I, I understand that. But 
my, my thing is, is I get it's early on in the season and I'm not going to get bent out of shape over one game like that. It, I just felt in that situation, I just don't like seeing my manager just, just say, screw it because we don't have the arms. Like I just, yeah. I, I, I don't agree with that way of, of, of managing a game. Okay. So two, two things. One, you guys are basically making my point about the rain delay affecting Yamamoto and, and the domino effect it had for the rest of the, that game. So I just want to point that out. Not so much you, Kev, but uh, definitely on Jake's point. Second, Jake, you kind of answered your own question in a way. Joe Kelly has the ability to get into, but then out of trouble. And that's why he gets the longer leash because of that aspect. So you kind of just answered that point. Do I agree with it? No, I, I actually stand with you on a lot of that, on a lot of that, especially when the lineup got more left-handed dominant. Why aren't you getting Vestia up sooner? Even if you trust Joe Kelly to get out of that jam against righties, maybe, but not against lefties. And, and the Cardinals are kind of a, they're not a team that, that are going to overpower you. They're going to go station to station. So you definitely need to have a guy in there with more swing and miss caliber stuff. So that was the thing. So it was a bizarre inning. With and there the were a ton of, and sorry to interrupt, but there were a ton of lefties that Vessia could have been brought into face. And if you're not going to. I agree with you on that. Why wasn't Vessia brought in sooner? But it's because, well, you know, Joe's been in this situation before. He's a vet. He's a World Series champion. He's been there. He could get into, but out of trouble because he could throw 99 effortlessly. That is what Dave Roberts, I think, was thinking. And I don't agree with it. I just wanted to point that out. But that part of the scouting report messes up with Mark Pryor and, uh, you know, Connor McGinnis and, and of course, with with uh, with Dave Roberts at times. So, go ahead. And, and a few people that beat right for the Dodgers pointed out this flaw, which I agree with 100%. The, the bullpen roster construction is just a little flawed because the Cardinals did send up five or six left-handed bats in a row, and they went with Joe Kelly because the reverse splits say that Joe Kelly is more effective against lefties than Alex Vesey is right now. And I just don't understand why they are rostering just Alex Vesia and Ron Yarbrough, but mostly Alex Vesia when they don't trust him in high leverage because they clearly don't. Because in a two nothing ball game, you probably would go with Alex Vesia if they trusted him, but I don't think they do trust him. No, they don't, and that's a huge issue. I mean, it's a it's a really big issue. Not only not only because they don't have another left handed guy in in the bullpen. They did. They had Caleb Ferguson. Um, they had a TJ McFarlane. They had guys that, that they could have rostered. They had Victor Gonzalez at one point, you know, I mean, they had guys that they could roster. None of them really great options, to be honest. Like none of them, I would consider high leverage left-handed relievers. Ferguson, you could make a case for, but he's, he's a little bit too incons inconsistent. Like we saw last year, but he was but, always at your stadium though, Jake, just saying. Yes, I agree. But on the road, good. Yeah, the other the other issue is is that you don't have Trinan and you don't have Gratterall, who are both also reverse splits guys. So that was sort of the construction of this bullpen where they were like, we don't need a high leverage lefty if we've got all these right handed pitchers that can get lefties out. And two of those guys that can do it the best on this team, arguably, are you know, with the exception of Evan Phillips, are injured. So you're kind of you're kind of handcuffed kind of by their own doing, to be honest. Too smart for their own good sometimes. This is the problem when, you know, you you, you know too much quantum physics. I see Justin Yamas asking about Drew Pomeranz. The Dodgers did sign him to a minor league deal, and when they lost Justin Wilson to the Reds, and then they traded TJ McFarland to the Athletics, they picked up Drew Pomeranz, who was once a pretty effective lefty, kind of had some success as a starter and then a little bit as a reliever with Milwaukee and then has just been devastated with injuries the last three years or so. I don't know how much he has left in the tank, but the daughter certainly could be the team to fix him. So we just have to wait and see if Pomeranz could be called up at some point. Um, but yeah, I, I think we're going to be talking about this a lot and it's going to be like beating a dead horse about the daughters needing to find a second high leverage lefty reliever. I'm I'm ready to move on. Yeah, let's move on. People are talking about James Outman, but I don't want to talk about him first. I actually want to talk about Shohei Otani because I do feel like he has been pressing a little bit at the plate. I don't know if it's just the excitement that he's chasing that first 
Dodger home run because it will be glorious the moment it happens. But so far, he's hitting 269 with a 310 on base and only a 346 slugging. And he struck out six times. Um, he has at least one or two doubles. And I believe he has the three hardest base hits for the Dodgers recorded right now. But I do feel like he has been a little uncharacteristic where he's swinging a bit out of the zone and he's trying to chase that home run ball. And it's just not very Otani like so far. Yeah. And he's also come up in a few really key spots um, where they could have used him to, to come through most notably in the final inning of the ball game on Saturday night where he got a pitch that was, I mean, just served to him on a platter. If you go back and look at it, it was a, just a kind of floating change up slash. I don't even know if it was a fastball. I think it was a, a change up that was just kind of left out over the plate. Mm -hmm. And I, when I saw that pitch being thrown to him, my eyes lit up because I was like, Oh my God, he's going to demolish this and he just got under it. And so that's kind of an indication right there that he's just not on these pitches as well as you might like him to be. But also the other factor that, you know, cannot be lost on us at all here is the fact that all this shit is swirling around him with, with, with his translator, Ipe Mitsuhara. I mean, that's got to be distracting like nobody's business not only the fact that all of these allegations are all out there and it's a federal investigation and major league baseball is looking into it and all of that, but this guy Ipe was his best friend. I mean, they did, they did everything together. They were inseparable. And so now it's sort of like, who do, who can he trust? Can he, you know, can he trust Will Ireton, which I think he can because Will Ireton has been around for a long time with the Dodgers organization, but it's like, he must be feeling a lot of these different things. And so I'm going to give him, not only the benefit of the doubt, a long leash, you know, whatever phrase you want to use um, for him to get right, because he's going to get right. He's too good not to. Um, he's hit a few balls like extremely hard, like over 110 miles off, uh, miles an hour off the bat. He's hit some doubles and stuff. He just hasn't come through with runners on base yet, which will happen. It'll come. Um, I'm not worried at all, but it does feel like he is swinging for the fences. I mean, his, his helmet does seem to come off the top of his head a lot when he swings um, and he has to take that time out from the umpire and like, you know, uh, uh, wave his hair in the air and then put the helmet back on. So the just noticeable body language things, but honestly, I, 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 I'm not worried about this in the slightest. For sure. And I agree with both of you guys are saying, and uh, Kev, you took the words right out of my mouth. He, he was, he's pressing. And I was, you know, my girl's a huge Shohei Otani fan. She's a big Dodger fan, but she loves Otani. Uh, and what the one thing I said was, Hey, like I'm telling him this while he's missing pitches. Hey, it's okay. <sighs> Calm down. Stop trying to kill it. Stop trying to, you know, be a hero on every at bat. And I think there's two factors to it. And Jake, you touched on one, the elephant in the room, the Ipe situation. The other one is this, you ain't, Hey, you ain't in Anaheim anymore. Dorothy. I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. This is LA. You signed the biggest contract in the history of, of the MLB, you know, and I can say the same thing about Yamamoto. There, there are different expectations now. The game has changed, you know, so you have to adjust to that because pe more people are watching you and not just because you signed the big contract, but because of the situation that's going on, you know, with Ipe and the scandal and the investigation and everything like that. So I think that's something to be uh, looked at. And I hope Freddie Freeman, is somebody that could, you know, put an arm around him because it wasn't long ago Freddie was dealing with this as well. I think he was more productive. I don't think it was to the scale because Freddie wasn't dealing with the scandal. But also, it was not an easy adjustment, Freddie going from Atlanta to the Dodgers because of how everything ended with the Braves. And I hope Freddie is going to be there. Not that maybe Otani needs it, but just so he understands, like, hey, we've all kind of been through this, man. We've all kind of come here and had different successes elsewhere, but coming here, now the game has changed. It's different, you know, and there's more on us because everybody's watching us. So it's okay. You'll find your groove and you'll be Shohei Otani again. I'm just glad that the Dodgers did what I was hoping they would do. And they told that loser to Ipe, sorry, pal, you're on your own. You got to find your own flight, asshole. 
Karma's a bitch. I, I, I hope Lane Kiffin was there and, and be like, on the tarmac, huh? I know <laughs> right, that. right. Just drop the link to our Discord chat. We're almost up to 100 members. This has been awesome. Very interactive, especially when Dodgers games are going. So I drop the link. Make sure you join if you want to talk some Dodgers with us. Um, now I'm going to pull up the question because I know people want us to talk about them. And Aaron Attic, you got the spotlight. It's still early, but W2F is up with James Outman. I mean, I'm not too worried about James Outman. I know that he is off to a slow start, only hitting 118, uh, no power so far, five strikeouts, um, definitely chasing for sure. But he does have three RBIs. He is still getting on base. Um, I'm just going to leave it at it's only been five games for him personally, and I'm not worried. Give him give him more time. I mean, look, there's a, there's a giant – hole in James Outman's swing that they figured out last season, which is basically a breaking ball that that sort of breaks towards his knees, like an in, inside breaking ball that kind of dips below the zone that he swings at. So an inside breaking ball, so to speak. That's been the big hole in his swing. And he's not figured out, A, how to hit that pitch, or B, lay off of it. And it's kind of continuing into this season. He's going to strike out a lot. And I think the we might see some lineup reshuffling if this continues. Because if you have Teoscar Hernandez batting in front of Altman and then followed by Hayward, I mean, that that's a lot of strikeouts right there, you know, with those three. So that might be uh, an opportunity possibly to shift some things around, but I don't know what, I don't know what kind of shifting you could do because the first six hitters against right-handed pitching, a right-handed starter, let's say is pretty locked in. So where are you going to move them? You know, you can only hit them seventh, eighth or ninth. <clears throat> and Lux is one of those guys who's all, I mean, you've got Lux Hayward and Outman at the bottom of your order, um, all left-handed. And a lot of strikeouts. So that's a problem. And I'm hoping that James can hope maybe adjust to that. I don't know. But it seems like the same hole that they found in his swing last season has returned this season. Yeah, he. I, I'm not too concerned yet. But, you know, one of the things that – and I know he got traded, Manuel Margot. But I said one of the reasons why, if you're the Dodgers, you bring in a Margot, why you bring in a Teoscar Hernandez – you want to know that you won't need to send James Outman down. And let's be honest, he had a lot of ups and downs last year with this team. And I think it's not the worst thing in the world in this instance why, you know, now you replace Margot with Kike Hernandez. Because there could be a time, like you said, Jake, if he does not adjust, then you might need to be like, hey, we're going to send you down for a little bit to work on some things, tweak some things in your swing. So that way you're not so prone to strikeouts. You're not so prone to, uh, you know, to the curveball, the hole in the swing, like you were alluding to. So I'm not too concerned yet. It's six games. You know, you don't want to overreact to a hot start and you don't want to under, you, you know, you don't want to, uh, you know, panic with some of these struggles. So just something to kind of keep in mind, but, uh, yeah, it's definitely something that you want to see fixed sooner than later. There are a couple hitters. I want to spotlight, on the opposite end of how great they've been playing. But before we get to that, they may pop up naturally. I want to give anyone in the chat who's watching live right now to get your questions in and we'll try to knock out some Q and a, and while you guys are typing and all that, I do want to make sure that you guys are all aware that the incline Dodgers podcast is presented by tick pick and they've been offering great deals. If you're trying to get to Dodger stadium early on this season, no service fees at checkout. I'm seeing prices that are just, way lower than I expected given all the superstars that they just recently signed. So make sure you download the tick pick app. There are no service fees at checkout. And if you're not ready to go to a Dodger game for some reason, you want to go watch the Lakers in their playoff chase, go watch the Lakers. If you're just trying to get ready for NFL season, you can buy your tickets there on tick pick as well. So no questions yet in the chat. So that's not great, but we'll continue anyways. So hot hitters. Mookie Betts, mm. my goodness, coming out of the gates, hardcore. He already has four home runs this season. 
10 RBIs. He's hitting 500 with a 1700 OPS. This is the best start I've ever seen for Mookie Betts in his Dodgers campaign. This guy just continues to get it done. My goodness. Um, he's my MVP pick. So yep. I'm liking what I'm seeing so far. He's my National League MVP. I I'm I would be so happy and thrilled if one of my predictions from the beginning of the season came true at the end of the season. They typically don't. So I'm really there's a lot riding on this for me with Mookie Betts. But all in all seriousness, he has been an absolute dream so far. I mean, this guy is just showing the way and he's leading the way and he looks so locked in. I've never seen him so locked in before. Um, and the powers there. And I think it's great because Freddie Freeman's also off to a hot start. I think it's great for Shohei Otani to be kind of smack dab in the middle of that for the sort of the quote unquote old guard of the team to kind of show the way and welcome him to the franchise and sort of say, Hey man, like while you're figuring stuff out, we got it. We can handle this. We're going to provide the thump. We're going to provide the excitement. We're going to provide the on base and, and it's contagious because there have been a lot of innings where um, Mookie, Freddie and Shohei have gotten on. In fact, it happened in Saturday's game against Lance Lynn. They loaded the bases with nobody out. And then it was three straight strikeouts to Smith, Muncie, and Teoscar Hernandez. And that was that. So yeah. I, I think that this big three is as advertised. And what a treat to watch. Definitely. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more on that. Mookie has just been absolutely terrific. Picking up where he left, left off in last year's regular season. I know he really struggled. And I know I, I was the first one to give both him and Freddie Freeman a lot of crap for, you know, how crappy they were in that divisional round against Arizona. Uh, but th at the same point in time, you cannot deny the fact that these guys are still going to be pivotal to the success of the Dodgers, even with a guy like Shohei Otani aboard. So it's great to see Mookie get out to a great start and setting the tone, and, and hopefully that continues. And honestly, guys, he's done a really solid job at shortstop so far. I, you know, he's not going to be perfect. He'll make the occasional blunder like anybody else, but it's been more of a seamless transition than maybe having Gavin Lux there at shortstop. I think we could agree on that. All right, it's question time. We've got a few, and hit that like button while you're at it. That way more people will get in this chat, and they can ask questions or chat along as well. Brian, where do you see Muncy long term with the Dodgers? He stay here for the rest of his career, but dot dot dot. Well, if you ask Max Muncy, he wants to be a Dodger for life. He keeps taking these team friendly contracts to be yep. able to uh, remain on the roster and also give the Dodgers financial flexibility to go out and make the big splashes like they've done. So. He is a guy that I would love to have on this team long term and for the rest of his Dodgers career. The what he provides offensively, you take the hits defensively. It is frustrating and it does feel like the errors that happened to him happened in very crucial spots. Mm -hmm. um, and it, that's very unfortunate. But what he's able to provide in the clutch, power, run production you can't just find that anywhere and the dodgers found him off the scrap heap cast away from oakland like most players are and they turned him into an all-star and that's just something that you gotta hold on to especially him providing the production that he provides so if he's able to continue to do this i would love to have him on the team for the rest of his career yeah, I agree. I've been a big Max Muncy fan for really since he got here, uh, 2018. Let's be honest, guys. He's been a massive part of their success. You know, they don't win that World Series without him. You know, I remember coming off that very difficult game in game four where Chris Taylor, you know, made a bad throw. Will Smith couldn't cor corral the ball. Kenley Jansen blew the save. He came back that next game and hits a towering bomb off Tyler Glass now that set the tone for, for that game five win. So, I mean, you cannot deny that this guy loves the big stage. Now, has he been great defensively? Not by any means. Has he been okay? Yes. 
Now, okay is it also means you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make errors. And, you know, I would like to see him continue to shore that up. But at some point, like Jake says, you're just going to have to live with what he does defensively and live with the 12 to 13 errors he's going to probably have in a season and roll your eyes and be like, hey, come on, man. But, hey, let's be honest, guys. He ain't the only one we got to worry about in this infield. Between Lux, between two catchers' interferences, I mean, come on, man. Like, even yeah, by two team, different catchers. Two different catchers. Like, I mean, these are – when you look at some of the runs that they gave up in this series, could have totally been avoidable had guys been doing their jobs better. Yeah, I mean, to answer the question, from what I'm aware, the Dodgers don't have a third baseman in their system that's worth calling up anytime soon. So I think Max Muncy is here for the foreseeable future, and they're going to continue to work out deals. As long as he keeps taking these team-friendly deals, there's, there's no reason to move on. Michael Carrillo, are we – Still super concerned about the lefties teams are throwing at us. So far, no. And Teoscar Hernandez was the other bat I wanted to bring up. So this is actually a, a perfect question. He's picked um, – Teoscar Hernandez has picked up right where J.D. Martinez left off, a lefty destroyer. He obliterated Zach Thompson with two home runs in game two of the series, and then he hit another home run today. Teoscar Hernandez has been that lefty killer that the Dodgers needed to have on a consistent basis with him in the lineup and the ability to play the field. That's huge. Mookie Betts has been on a tear against lefties as well. Will Smith can hold his own. Um, the, the guys that are going to need to step up, and so far they have. Chris Taylor's looked pretty solid against lefties, and we're still waiting for Kike Hernandez to, to shine, but they got him on the bench as well. Yeah, Teoscar has been um... – a really, really nice addition. I mean, what what a underrated offseason move that the Dodgers made picking him up. It was uh it was such a su such a brilliant move to bring him on board, not only for his power, but also his defense. I mean, he can play the corner outfield spots really, really well. Like he's a really good defender. You're gonna get a lot of strikeouts for him. There's no doubt about that. That is going to be something that is going to happen throughout the entire season. But just like with Max Muncy at third base, you take that when the power is there. And so far, the power is there. Now, to the question, am I concerned about the lefties teams are throwing at us? I am a little bit because it seems like that's what teams are going to do. They've stockpiled left-handed pitching in their bullpens just for us because they know we struggle a little bit against left-handed pitching. Not everybody, but – up and down collectively the lineup we do struggle against left-handed pitching and so they're just going to keep throwing left-handed pitching at us and not really platoon that much when a right-handed bat comes to the plate because they'll take their chances of a dodgers hitter against the left-handed pitcher versus a right-handed pitcher so that is something i believe we will continue to see throughout the season regardless of who figures it out against left-handed pitching or not uh, I'm not too concerned about it yet. You know, I mean, you got to go out there and you got to try to, you know, change your approach. And let's be honest, guys, this has been a problem for the Dodgers for the last decade, uh, hitting le left-handed starters or left-handed relievers. That's, this isn't anything new, but as far as Teoscar Hernandez goes, man, I, I, I'm glad he's making me look good. Cause I was on this show and I said, the one guy that I'm, ex that, that I hope they go after, obviously, in addition to Shohei Otani, is Teoscar Hernandez. I love the fact he could play either corner of the outfield. He's going to lengthen your lineup. He's got pop. He brings an edge. He brings a swag to the table. I mean, it's T.O. Scar right there. And by the way, Jake, you'll appreciate this. Do you remember Billy Crystal's song during uh, the Oscars when he would introduce the best pictures? It's a wonderful night for Oscar. <laughs> Tay Oscar. Willie Homer. Oh, I that, remember that. that should be his walk up song. <laughs> nice, Chris. Very well done. I remember you saying this, Chris, that you're very high on T Oscar. And I actually texted, I think, Jake a night or two ago. I was like, that was Chris's guy as well. Yep. So I remember. Yeah, Dennis Gonzalez, true incline loyalist. Thank you so much for the super chat. We really appreciate it. And this is awesome what he typed out. Very happy for Will Smith getting his 10 year extension. Glad there wasn't a repeat of the Mike Piazza situation hashtag screw Fox Corp. Insane that the Dodgers were able to work out a 10 year deal for 140 million, 34% deferred. So they're paying him like nine something million a year. 
Um, I don't know if Will Smith will be a catcher the entire duration of that 10 year contract. So I was kind of thinking maybe he could eventually transition to third base. No idea what the plans are long-term for Will Smith, but he's been pretty awesome so far and he's really doing a great job in the cleanup spot. Um, so it's, it's glad that this saga is over. We don't have to worry about the questions for years to come. We'll, what will the Dodgers do with Will Smith? Because he's here for the next decade. Yeah. And it also may change the Dodgers plans in terms of Dalton rushing and Diego Cartaya. So keep your eyes on that um, because Diego Cartaya could be expendable in a trade. Now uh, mm -hmm. you might see Dalton rushing move to a different position play first base or third base in order to try and crack this roster in a different way because <clears throat> Will Smith is our catcher and I couldn't be more excited what he's done for this franchise in you know arguably a short amount of time has been nothing short of spectacular um he has solidified himself into one of the best catchers in baseball if not the best there's arguments to be made for Adley Rutschman, GL, a JT Real Muto. I get that. But he is a top catcher in baseball, not only offensively, but he is a really good defensive catcher. The pitchers seem to get along with him really, really well. He's just got to cut down on the uh, catcher's interference. That's not great, but that, should, that, that shouldn't be an issue long term. I, I think this is a great signing, and I'm expecting big things from Will Smith. I predicted that he's going to have a career high in RBIs this season, and he's going to hit over 25 home runs because I feel like he's going to elevate his game even more this year. I was very happy to see him resign. Uh, one last thing for you, have to, to meaning the Dodgers have to worry about next winter, about what's the future of him, because you're going to have question marks across the board with Bueller and, and several others as well. So this is one area you, you could take care of. Just a solid individual, first of all. Good dude, family man. You know, looks like just the, the kind of guy that you would run into at Home Depot on a Saturday while he's buying some wallpaper and flooring. And be like, hey, Will, can I get an autograph? And he's like, yeah, man, no problem. He looks like that kind of guy. Anchoring a pitching staff and the cleanup hitter of a lineup. We probably haven't seen anything like that from either, you know, not since maybe Piazza or even Joe Maurer. I'll go back to that about, you know, seven, you know, 16, 17 years ago, uh, the, the, the now hall of fame, uh, 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 catcher for, from the Minnesota twins. So, uh, and it's a team friendly deal guys, 10 years, 140 million. I mean, that's, that's solid right there. So I would say out of this contract, six, seven years as the starting everyday catcher, maybe a backup. And then maybe you transition him to third base, maybe even first, depending on where Freddie Freeman is at. So definitely something to keep an eye on. All right. So due to some time constraints, we're going to have to power through these questions. So we might just do one host per question. So I'll take this next one. Is Gavin Stone for real? For real? Why did he look so terrible last year and looks decent so far? Um, as in, uh, in terms of last year, there were a couple issues. One, they said he had a blister on his foot as well as he was tipping pitches. And there were some confidence issues. So it all just didn't really pan out for the rookie for Gavin Stone. Um, in terms of this year, he absolutely is for real. He looks way better at the major league level so far as first go around. You just look at the pitches and the stuff that he's throwing out there. That's a really good pitcher. Um, I don't know if he's going to hang on to a rotation spot once Bueller is activated and maybe Kershaw, but Gavin Stone will be an effective pitcher for the Dodgers one way or another in 2024. Roy Estrada. If not Pajes, what bat do the Dodgers go after before at a trade deadline? Who wants to take that? Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if not Pajes, what bat do the Dodgers go after before or after the trade deadline? Uh, it's going to really depend on what teams are kind of out of uh, the mix. Uh, obviously, you would probably want to get somebody who could play the outfield a little bit, maybe the infield. Uh, I think the name to watch out for right now is Willie Adamas as far as uh, the infield. Uh, you know, I, I know that's the one guy because of the struggles of the throws from Gavin Lux. And I'm, I'm not sure what to expect from, from Milwaukee. I think they had a really good weekend series against the New York Mets. It's not saying much, but if he, if, if the Brewers happen to drop off and Adamas becomes available, that would definitely be somebody I like. Love the grit of the kid. He's very good defensively. Uh, and he's got pop, and he could also lengthen your lineup a little bit. So that would be the guy I would just kind of keep an eye on for now. Yeah, I agree. I think they're going to trade for him eventually. Yang Yi, 
I know it's his first rehab, but how would you rate Walker Buehler's pitching performance today? He went three and a third innings, three runs, four strikeouts, I believe, and he um, threw around 50 pitches, and he hit 94 to 95 on a consistent basis. The thing I care about most is, is the velocity. So to hear that it's at 94, 95, like I'm encouraged by that. When he started to kind of dip uh, in 22, um, his velocity went down significantly. And so that was very, very worrisome. So if he's got the velocity working, he's got that Walker Bueller zip on that fastball to get it up to about 97, 98 you know, he's fully back. So I I'm encouraged by the velocity and the fact that he was able to do it healthily and no setbacks whatsoever, as opposed to looking at the results. DM chances. Pajes gets called up and plays against lefties DM. I'm going to say there's a 69% chance. Andy Pajes gets called up and plays against lefties. Maria G where does Bueller fit in the rotation? Someone going to get sent down and when is he coming up? Um, four rehab starts is what they're saying. So if you do about 20 days or so, you can expect Walker Buehler to come <clears throat> back up to the Dodgers in late April. He's absolutely going to fit in this rotation. There's no questions about that. They want Walker Buehler starting for the Dodgers. <clears throat> Who would get sent down? I mean, Gavin Stone's the only one that has options. So unfortunately, I think it will be Gavin Stone. We haven't seen James Paxton yet, um, but he is going to face the Giants um, Monday evening for his Dodgers debut. Um, okay, what else? This might be the final question. AS all out. What to make of the other young catchers like Rushing and Cartaya with the Will Smith extension? Uh, is there more willingness to trade Rushing now? No, I don't think they should trade Dalton Rushing because he can play first base. He might end up being Freddie Freeman's uh, – uh, Take he'll take over for Freddie successor. Freeman when he – yeah, exactly, successor when Freeman's done playing for the Dodgers. And rushing also does have the ability to play the outfield, so they could stick him out in left field if if the uh, opportunity presents itself. So rushing could be a, a utility man in the short term because I don't know how many years Chris Taylor has left. They're going to find a way to get rushing onto this roster. And he could back up catch Will Smith. You could throw him 50 games behind the plate and play the field the other. So Cartai is the one I think might be on his way out. Yeah, that'll be the, the main trade uh, target for, for the Dodgers. And I agree. I think he'll be – before you guys put him in all these different positions, I think he'll be the kind of uh, Will Smith mentor or, or Will Smith will mentor him, uh, you know, as, as he, uh, you know, gets called up and True gets to the behind the plate. Absolutely. All right. So the final thing I wanted to cover, and then if you have final thoughts, shoot them your way. Dodgers Giants kick off their first series of 2024. And so far, it looks like the Giants have some more offense behind them. Michael Conforto's already got two home, home runs and is hitting the ball well. Matt Chapman, who they signed in the offseason, he's got two home runs and has some power as well. And then, of course, um, Lee who is not Kim. I really screwed that one up last week when I called him Kim, but it's Lee. He already has a home run as well. Uh, Jung Hu Lee. Um, so the Dodgers are going to face a new lineup that they're not accustomed to facing in the past. And um, right now it looks like James Paxton will face Keaton Wynn, Tyler Glass now against Logan Webb and Bobby Miller against Kyle Harrison. How many home runs does Max Muncy hit in this series? <laughs> <laughs> I say he hits two. All right. I'm going to say one. All right. Yeah, I think this is going to be a pretty tightly contested series. Um, I'll say Max Muncy hits two home runs as well. I expect the Dodgers to at least take two of these three games. Let's make a statement early on and put the Giants in their place. Um, this, is a, this is a great opportunity for James Paxton to make a Dodgers name for himself. So I'm really looking forward to watching his Dodgers debut. And um, it's going to be a great test for our, our starters as, as well. Tyler Glass now, third start for the Dodgers. Said he grew up a Dodgers fan. Well, now he gets to face the Giants. I'm sure that's an exciting opportunity for him. And Bobby Miller making his second start of 2024. Let's see if he can get another double-digit strikeout performance. So it's going to be a, a tightly contested series. Um, not too worried about the starters. I guess the bullpen more what I'll be keeping my eyes out on. 
will uh, Joe Kelly rebound? Will Alex Vessia rebound if they go to him? Because the Giants have a decent amount of lefties in their lineup. So who are they going to use in those spots? Yeah. Yeah, that'll be an interesting thing to take note of for sure. I'm excited for this uh, Giants series because it always is fun. No matter if the Dodgers are good, the Giants are good, or if they're both bad or one's good and one's bad, it's always a really, really great series between these two franchises. So I, I'm excited to see kind of this renewed uh, rivalry because, uh, you know, Farhan Zaidi went out and got a bunch of new toys and um, they're performing well for him so far. Kind of a, a interesting series that the Giants had against the Padres, um, kind of back and forth. Uh, I think both of those teams are very evenly matched mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. So they're they're going to be the two biggest threats, as well as Arizona, to the Dodgers in this division. I don't think any of these teams are coming anywhere close to the Dodgers when it's all said and done. But in terms of giving them fits and competition in the division – these are going to be very competitive games. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing how the, the Dodgers bats respond against two of the Giants best pitchers in Logan Webb and Harrison um, to see where, where we stack up against them and for our pitchers to, you know, see what they do with this lineup. This is, this is going to be a much uh, more potent lineup than what they just faced in St. Louis. Definitely. Uh, and I thought the Giants, along with Arizona, they had really good off seasons, uh, subtle moves, team friendly moves. I think they took advantage of the fact that some of these guys did not get the kind of money or years, uh, you know, specifically Blake Snell, but even Matt Chapman or even Jorge Soler. So they have got a solid, solid team, good mix of young guys and established vets who have had uh, different uh, success throughout their careers. So and they got a good manager. I think Bob Melvin was a definite upgrade over Gabe Kapler. So we'll see how that all plays out. But a good early test uh, for, for the Dodgers within the division. And to kind of basically, you know, show these other teams like, hey, what you all did was cute. But we're still the Dodgers. Thank you guys for listening to this week's episode of the Incline Dodgers podcast. Um, if you aren't subscribing already to the podcast on the audio feed, hit that subscribe button, leave us a five-star review. And if you're watching in the YouTube chat and you haven't left a comment, feel free to leave a comment after the fact and let us know how many home runs Max Muncy hits in this series. But Kevin Klein here, I think we're going to close it out. No final thoughts today. Everyone have a great um, April Fool's Day. Don't prank anyone too hard. And we're out. Go Dodgers.